All right, guys, today we're going to talk about Ventrix. Um, we're going to talk about two systems. The first one we're going to talk about is the Monitor, which I like to call the old system, only because if you've been in healthcare for any amount of time, you've likely seen this system. And we're also going to talk about the AccuDream, which is a newer system that you'll see your patients um, have in place. So for each of these devices, we're going to talk about general setup, um, configuring it with your Zool monitor, zeroing them and obtaining ICP readings. We're also going to discuss troubleshooting tips, uh, transport considerations, and some things that you'll need to report to the accepting unit or nurse. Um, the, the, the goal of this video is to give you just what you need to safely transport these patients from point A to point B. So we're not gonna get into involved discussions about pathophysiology of increased ICP or how to even manage increased ICPs. All of that information can be found on the Ventric reference, which is located in Canvas. So we have a lot to uh, talk about today, so let's get started. So prior to leaving to go out to pick up these patients, you're gonna need to ascertain from the referring nurse which system that the patient has in place because the mounting systems that we have are unique to the individual devices. So a couple questions that you could ask um, is, is the Buretrol separate from the device or is it attached to the side? Or you might ask, is there a separate pole with centimeters of water markings on it? Or are the centimeter of water markings actually all part of the device? You could also have the nurse take a picture of them and send you a text message or maybe FaceTime with her. If you're unsure prior to departure, you may need to take both mounting systems with you because as I said, and we'll get into it as we talk about each device individually, the mounting systems are unique to the device and the proper mounting system is necessary in order for you to adequately set up the device and monitor ICPs. Okay, the first system we're gonna talk about is the monitor or the old system. And we're gonna start from the point that the patient was just moved to the survival flight stretcher. So the first thing that you're gonna to wanna to do is put the mounting plate underneath the patient's shoulders. And I choose shoulders because there's a lot of weight to the patient, and this will allow for some stability of the monitoring system under there. Oh, he's really heavy. <laughs> okay. So your transducer is gonna be secured in these slots here. So you wanna make sure that it will be at the level of the tragus using this little antenna piece, and you can adjust it up and down accordingly. The next thing we wanna do is move our device to our mounting system. So you're going to take the transducer and place it in one of these little slits here and then tighten down the screw. And then you're going to mount your Buretrol to the pole. And the one thing I want to say about this is there's two different markings. One is centimeters of water. The other one is millimeters of mercury. You want to make sure that when you're setting your level of the Buretrol, you're using the centimeters of water side. Think water on the brain. So it's a square here that slides onto the beer, or onto the pole. And then you place it at the level that's ordered by the physician. And they'll write this as a level above tragus. If they don't write anything, according to our survival flight protocol, it, we're to put it at 15 centimeters above tragus. So the next thing you wanna do is attach your system to your Zoll monitor. So we're gonna turn this on. Now, I didn't mention this before, but you may want to grab an extra pressure cable um, just so that you can monitor arterial pressures as well as ICPs, and we only carry one of these. So you put it into the pressure port. You attach this just like you do an arterial transducer. So you can see that this is zero probe, just like an art line. First thing you want to do is go down and label this appropriately. So you're going to select zero probe and then you want to scroll down to source label and then you want to label it icp so you just scroll down to icp so to zero the system you first need to open the stopcock closest to the patient's head open the system or turn it off to the port this stopcock is in the right position you want to turn it off to the patient you're going to lower your buretrol to zero Swing over here. You're going to select zero probe. 
and go down to zero probe. Now the one thing I want to say about zeroing is unlike an arterial uh, pressure line, we don't open the stopcock and zero this to air, and that's for infection control purposes. We should do everything that we can to prevent the system from becoming open at any point. In the top of the Buretrol, there's a membrane that vents out here to the top, and that's how it vents to air and actually zeroes the system. So once it's zeroed, then you turn your stopcock, I'm sorry, you raise your Buretrol to the level ordered, which we're just gonna assume is 15. And then you turn your stopcock up, which allows the system and the patient to communicate with the transducer, and then you'll have your ICP reading. Once you've obtained your ICP reading, you should turn your stopcock off to the transducer, which allows the patient, this whole system is open, so it allows the patient to communicate with the Buretrol and facilitates the therapeutic drainage of CSF that the system was adapted for. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the AccuDrain or the new system. And we're gonna start from the point that the patient's just been moved to our stretcher. So the first thing you want to do is place the mounting system underneath the patient. And I recommend under the shoulders because the patient has a little bit of weight to them and it will provide some security during transport so that it doesn't move. The next thing we need to do is get the system over to the pole. So this system has two grips in the back that have rubber bands across them that allow them to grip to the pole. So the way you open them up is to depress this white lever, and then you're going to slide the system onto the pole, making sure that both grips are around the pole for extra security. And then you just let go of the lever, and that allows it to secure to the pole. So ensuring that the transducer is at the level of the tragus is a little bit different on this system. They have this nice little level system here. On a string. So you're going to come across at the level of the transducer and put your string at the level of the tragus and look for where your bubble is and then adjust your system accordingly until the bubble's in the middle. This tells me that my transducer is at the level of my tragus. Once you have that you just wrap this back up. If you don't wrap it up it tends to get caught up and make spaghetti. But you wrap this up and then with the black circle, ring, you just attach it to the back. So the next thing we need to do is attach the system to our monitor. So we have our regular pressure cables. You may want to grab a couple extras of these before you go so that you can also measure arterial pressure. We only carry one of each, um, but you may want to grab some extras. That way you can monitor arterial pressure as well as ICP. This is just like setting up an art line. So you notice that when it comes on, it's our regular arterial line setup, but we want to label this ICP so that we know which, mon which value we have. So you scroll down to zero probe, select, go to source label, which is second from the bottom, and then scroll down to ICP, which is also second from the bottom. Now the way we zero this machine um, is much like the other machine. You're going to turn the stopcock off to the patient, lower your Buretrol to zero. Sorry, I keep stepping in front of the camera. <laughs> Select zero, zero the probe. Now the one thing I wanna say about zeroing is unlike an arterial line setup, we don't open the system to air and that's for infection control purposes. This has direct communication with the patient's brain. So the way that the system zeroes is on the top here, there's a membrane with a hole that allows it to automatically zero to air so there's no need to open the system. So after you get your ICP value, you're gonna return your Buretrol to the ordered level, which if the doctor doesn't give you one is 15 above tragus. And then you're going to turn your stopcock up, which is off to the Buretrol, which allows the patient and the brain and the system to communicate with the transducer, and you'll get your ICP reading. 
Once you have your ICP reading, you're going to take your stopcock, turn it off to the transducer, which opens the system from the patient's brain to the buretrol, which allows for the therapeutic drainage of CSF, which is what the system was built to do. Okay, so now we're going to address troubleshooting tips. Hopefully you won't have any of these issues, but if you do, hopefully this will be helpful for you. There's four potential problems that you may encounter with the system. The first one is that it becomes occluded either from blood clots or tissue in the system, preventing it from draining. The second is that the system won't zero. The third is that you're unable to obtain an ICP reading. And the fourth is inadvertent disconnection. And we're gonna go over each of those here. So if the system appears to be occluded, and the way you can tell it's occluded is if you drop your buretrol to zero, you should see some drip of CSF. So remember that the system is set to therapeutically drain CSF for any ICP greater than the level of the buretrol, and we all walk around with ICPs higher than zero. So if you drop it to zero and you don't see any dripping of CSF, you can assume that your system is occluded. And the way that you rectify that situation is you wanna grab some preservative-free saline, which all of our pre-filled flushes are. And this should always be a two nurse process just to make sure that your stopcocks are the right way. You wanna to go to the port closest to the patient's head, turn the stopcock off to the patient's head because you don't wanna flush into the brain. And this is where a second nurse is always helpful. Remove the cap, clean the port. Remember there's a huge risk of infection anytime you go into this system. And then you're going to flush 10 cc's of saline back toward the buretrol and hopefully remove the clot from the system. You want to get a clean sterile cap, I just don't have one. And then make sure to open your stopcock, open the system back up by turning it off to this port. And then make sure that you account for that 10 cc's that you put into the system. You don't want that to be included in your CSF output. Um, for the hour. And so after you flushed it, um, note to see if you have any dripping. You can put a second 10 cc through here. Probably wouldn't do much more than that. And then if it still doesn't have CSF dripping, then you can assume that your patient's ICP is low. So the second issue that you might encounter is that the system won't zero. Um, and likely the reason for that is that the membrane at the top became wet, allowing or preventing it from zeroing to air. There's not really much that you can do about it um, because you can't just go change the buretrol in the membrane while you're in transport. But if you can't zero it, then you likely don't have an accurate ICP. So um, just know, and you'll want to report that to the accepting unit that you were unable to zero the system and then they may end up having to replace it. The third issue that you might encounter is that um, you're unable to, to obtain an ICP reading. If that's the case, first you want to make sure that your system's not occluded. If it won't zero, you can assume that your membrane is wet, but we can still um, estimate our ICP. And the way that we do that is by dropping our beer call to zero. Remember, like we just talked about, the system is designed to therapeutically drain CSF for any ICP that's higher than the level of the buretrol. So at zero, if we're not occluded, we should drain CSF. And then we just want to march up our buretrol one or two centimeters of water at a time and note where the drippage of CSF stops, and that'll be your, your estimated ICP. For example, if at 12, I still have dripping of CSF, I can assume that my ICP is higher than 12 because we're, we're having therapeutic drainage. But if I go up to 13 and it stops dripping, then we can assume that our ICP is less than 13. So our estimated ICP is somewhere between 12 and 13. The last problem that you may have is an inadvertent disconnection of the system. And this is an emergency um, for infection control purposes. The whole system when you get to the referring hospital is going to have to be replaced. So the goal of what we're talking about here is just trying to keep the system as clean as possible until you can get them to where you're going. So if the system becomes, in, becomes inadvertently disconnected, 
you're going to want to take some gauze, wrap it around the tubing, and then clamp it closed. You'll open up an alcohol pad, place the open end into the alcohol pad, and then tape it shut. And then you're going to want to let your accepting unit and physician know as soon as possible so that they can prepare to change out the system as soon as you arrive at the hospital. So next we're going to talk about transport considerations, some things that you want to keep in mind when you're transporting patients with a ventric. The first is elevating the head of the bed. So elevation of your head is one of the ways to mitigate elevated levels of ICPs. Now you see what happens to our Buretrol here when we elevate the head of the bed. And this only applies to the new system. Unfortunately, the old system or the monitor system does not have the capability to do this. But down here, there's a screw and you can loosen that screw. It's kind of like an antenna. And then you can straighten this back up so that you can keep your Buretrol straight while elevating the head of your patient's bed. And the reason why this is beneficial is because if it's off to the side, the CSF dripping might actually get the membrane in the top of the Buretrol wet, which will prevent you from being able to zero the system. The second thing is clamping. So anytime you're moving the patient from their bed to the survival flight stretcher or the stretcher to the accepting bed, and largely in and out of vehicles because things could get bumped and, and misplaced, you want to clamp the system in two spots, not clamp, you want to turn your stopcocks, my apologies, you want to turn your stopcock off in two places. So the first one is closest to the patient's head, you want to just turn it off. And then you'll want to, at your level of your transducer, turn your stopcock down, which is off. This prevents any inadvertent over drainage of CSF if the Buretrol and transducer were to become misplaced. The other thing to keep in mind is that the university actually has a policy limiting the amount of clamping that can be done of ventric systems within a 24 hour period. And that's not really realistic to us because we're doing an awful lot of moving. And what's more important is to prevent inadvertent over drainage. Um, but you should do you should do your best to limit the amount of clamping that you do. So as soon as the patient comes onto your stretcher or into a transport vehicle, you should be setting the system up and opening up the stopcock so that it can drain. The third thing that we want to do is secure the system to the head. These ventric wires and even the Codman wires, they're very thin um, and they're put in through a burr hole. So one of the things that I recommend is coiling your tubing and taping it across the patient's head. That way, if it gets pulled during transport, it just gives you a little bit of give. If you don't coil it and you get some pull, you can just pull that right out of the patient's head, and that's not a very fun phone call to have to make to the accepting physicians. Uh, the fourth thing that you want to avoid is hourly burping of the system. So it has been past practices to just at the top of every hour just drain 10 or 15 or some random amount of CSF out of the system. Um, I would highly encourage you to set the system up at a level that's either written by the physician or according to our protocols is 15 centimeters above tragus. Open it up and let the system do therapeutic drainage of CSF. If you're simply burping an amount, you could, this could lead to um, either over or under drainage of CSF. So you should set the system up and use it the way it was designed. The last thing I want to talk about in terms of transport considerations is your drainage bag. So a patient that's been in the ICU for a while, they might end up with a kind of a full drainage bag when you get there. A newer system likely won't, but that bag can get heavy. So if it is quite full, you should probably consider changing this before you leave for transport. Any hospital that can set up a ventric system can get you a new drainage bag. The one thing to keep in mind is that this is a sterile procedure. Again, this system communicates with the patient's brain, so you want to take every infection control um, idea, you want to keep that in, in um, you want to make sure that you keep infection control as a priority. So, sterile gloves. You just go in here and unscrew the bag. It 
comes off, you just pull it up, it attaches in the holes here. And then if this were a new bag, there would be some kind of, this cover would be on it. Put it into your system, unscrew the blue cap, clean off the port at the bottom of the Buretrol, and then screw it back in. The other thing I wanna say about CSF collection in the bag while we're sitting here is this stopcock right here. So up in the ICUs, we, they, they tend to chart hourly output of CSF. Um, and then at the, at the top of the hour, they just turn the stopcock off to this little port and allow it to be open to the bag, which allows that hour CSF to go down into the bag. If you do that, don't forget to turn this stopcock off to the Buretrol or you'll lose that hour CSF output and it'll just go down into the bag and you won't be able to report to the accepting unit an accurate amount of CSF output. The very last thing that we want to talk about is uh, reporting off on a Ventric to the accepting unit. There's a few things that they're going to want to know. The first thing that they want to know is the date and the time of the Ventric placement. That'll be important to them. They may or may not ask you for an opening pressure. And what an opening pressure is, is just the very first ICP that was recorded when they placed the device. And what that tells them is how much pressure was inside the cranial vault before they were able to drain CSF. It kind of allows them to make a prognosis and let them know just how severe the injury is. The third thing that you should be telling them in report is the ICP trends during transport um, and kind of what you did to mitigate those efforts and how effect or those ICPs and how effective your efforts were. They're going to want to know if the patient is on any antibiotics and the dosage and the last time that they were given. Any patient with a ventric device in place should be on some prophylactic antibiotics. There's two lab values that they're going to be particularly interested in. The first is your sodium and the second is your serum osmolality. Some of these smaller institutions may not know serum osmolality, but if they have it, um, the accepting unit is gonna wanna know that. And the last thing that you should be reporting off to them uh, has to do with CSF. They're gonna wanna know the amount, and you can either give them the hourly amount, an average, an hourly amount, or you can tell them how much CSF you've had over your two or three hour transport. They're gonna wanna know the color, whether it's um, straw colored, pink or bloody. The one thing I wanna say about that is if your patient becomes awake and agitated, it's not uncommon for your CSF to turn pink or bloody. Um, when we get really concerned is when it's bright red, frank red blood and we have a lot of it. But anytime your patient's agitated, it will turn color and it should subside as soon as the patient is calm. And the last thing they're gonna to wanna to know about CSF is characteristics. If, if it's clear or cloudy, obviously cloudy, um, indicating that there's a possible infection. So as you look at CSF in the Buretrol, you should be able to see through it. It should be clear.